Something Like Forever, written by J. Bell, narrated by Kevin R. Free at Brickshop Audio, Inc. Part 1, Acapulco, 2014 Chapter 1 This is the end of our story. Looking back, it's hard to understand how we reached this point. Infatuation led to a rollerblade accident, and from there, love, while it lasted. Although now I see that it never went away. Separation doesn't cure a broken heart. Meeting a guy in the clouds sure helped, but like all angels, his feet only touched the ground for so long. When all hope seemed lost, that old love from my youth returned, bringing more than comforting nostalgia. What followed in his wake was new, a dream reborn, a second chance. Ben Bentley looked up from his phone, the cold digital screen a stark contrast to his surroundings. He was standing on a beach, warm sand slipping between his wiggling toes. Directly ahead, waves crashed into the shore, reminding him again of how all this had begun. Ben's eyes moved to the water where he spotted a bobbing head with dark hair and striking silver eyes. Tim Wyman was the man who, if the fates were kind, Ben would spend the rest of his life with. They were married now. This was their honeymoon. But as Ben watched the water pull away from the sand, he was reminded that vows and rings were no guarantee of a happy future. Anything could happen, no matter how heartfelt their wishes or adamant their promises. Hey! Maudlin thoughts disappeared at the sound of that voice. Ben turned to see someone special walking toward him. His son! The newly bestowed title lifted his spirits and filled him with pride. Jason Grant wore nothing but a pair of wet swim trunks that clung to his legs. His shoulders were broad, his build was slender. His hair stuck to his forehead in damp brown tangles, the blue eyes intense and locked onto his own. Jason was handsome in his own way, although Ben didn't feel attracted to him in the slightest. He always assumed that biologic connections made such things impossible. Ben certainly wasn't attracted to his sister, obviously, or any of his male cousins, but they were blood. Jason wasn't, but he was family. Legally now, the adoption papers had been signed, although their family bond had started long before then. Five years ago. Funny because it already felt much longer. An age difference of nearly ten years separated them. People would probably mistake Ben and Jason as brothers for the rest of their lives, but when it came to their relationship, the roles were that of a parent and child. Ben had experienced a lot not just the loss of one great love and the rediscovery of another. His heart had been put through the ringer in many other ways, but he had overcome each obstacle until his life settled down into a peaceful rhythm. Jason was still finding his way and often needed guidance. Judging from his current expression, the brave smile forced, now was one such occasion. You're crazy. Jason said, nodding at the phone. I know how addictive those things are, but this is paradise. He spread his arms wide as if presenting the world. He wasn't wrong. The sun was setting, the fiery sphere seeming to touch where the waters of the bay met the Pacific Ocean. Orange and blue intermingled in the heavens above, the colors darkening as the day drew to a close. Do you get a signal out here? Jason asked, coming to a stop in front of him and looking down at the phone. Mine's barely worked since we landed. Not really, Ben replied. I've got one bar, which is just enough to give me false hope, before it times out. Jason angled his head to see the phone better. Then, what are you doing? Oh, Ben held it up to show him before pocketing the phone. Just writing. I used to all the time when I was younger. Always felt like it helped me work through things. 
Uh-oh. Uh-oh? Ben repeated. Jason shrugged. People don't need to work through things if they're happy. This is your honeymoon. Ben laughed. I am happy. A little overwhelmed, too. So much has changed. I just got hitched and gave birth to a 24-year-old man. Gross, Jason said, grinning broadly. Still, it's not like you guys weren't already living together. And I've been around for ages now, so I don't see what's really changed. The smile faded. Oh. Ben forced his own smile to remain, despite how he felt. I'm going to miss you. Jason nodded, eyes becoming watery and Adam's apple bobbing as he swallowed. Then he turned to look beyond the waves at the gently swelling water. Tim wasn't alone out there. Two silhouettes could be seen, heads that faced each other and talked between bouts of action. Arms moved in arcs and feet kicked to propel them forward in a friendly competition. Ben had no trouble telling who was whom. The man who often threw back his head to laugh or who would launch into the air with arms pressed to his sides before plummeting beneath the surface like a stone, that was Tim. The name alone made Ben flash back to a small desk in a Texas high school where he had scribbled that name into a notebook over and over again. Next to this, he had written his own name, making himself a Wyman, but never truly believing that dream would one day come true. But it had, all except for the last name. Ben was too used to being a Bentley, and he didn't want Tim's name to change either. As for the other swimmer, the person who moved through the water with practiced precision, the one who kept a watchful eye whenever Tim performed a potentially harmful stunt, they didn't come much sweeter than him. William Townsend was a good man. Ben had no doubt about that. He only wished his profession wasn't quite so heroic. William was a Coast Guard rescue swimmer, and while that was noble and necessary, the job came with risks. His line of work was dangerous, and if anything should ever happen to him, Ben knew that pain all too well and would do just about anything to shield Jason from it. Aside from depriving Jason of the love that he so deserved, not that he wasn't tempted, William's occupation required him to live near an air station, which they definitely didn't have back home in Austin. This meant changes were necessary. William wanted to resume his career with the Coast Guard. Jason wanted that for him, too. Because of that, they were moving to the other side of the country, all the way to Oregon. I can't do it. Ben's attention whipped back to Jason. Between the crashing waves and the gradually stirring nightlife behind them, he wasn't sure if he had heard right, so he simply shook his head. Jason took a deep breath, chest heaving. I know you said you're proud of me, but I can't. It's like someone gave me everything I ever wanted, but then asked me to choose only one thing to keep. Most of it is easy, but not when you get to the people. Emma is my best friend, and you... His voice squeaked. You're my dad. Come here. Ben said, opening his arms. Jason accepted, squeezing desperately and sniffling over his shoulder. Ben patted his back, then rubbed it to comfort him. We'll always be here for you, you know that. Moving to Astoria won't change how we feel about you. Nothing can. Jason pulled away, head shaking. I wish I had never come up with the stupid idea, I know William wasn't happy being a paramedic, but most people don't like their job, right? It's more than that, Ben said. You told me how important it is that William can be where he's needed. To do what? To save lives, Jason said with a glum sniff. Then he looked hopeful. Paramedics save lives, too. He just doesn't get to swim while doing so. Ben resisted a smile. 
You also explained how few rescue swimmers there are. Not everyone can do what William was trained to. No, Jason said grudgingly. And what about his daughter? Daisy had been an unexpected surprise, but Jason had reacted with patience and love. You want her to have both parents near. Oregon will make that possible. Yeah, Jason said, wiping his eyes on the back of his wrist. His voice wavered. What about me? When do I get to have my family close again? We'll be with you, Ben said, feeling emotional himself. That's one of the best things about family. Nothing can break that bond, no matter how big the distance between us, or how much time goes by, I promise. Jason bit his bottom lip, perhaps to stop it trembling, and shook his head as if Ben couldn't possibly understand. He was right. Ben didn't know what it was like to grow up without parents. Jason had seen his family crumble and fall apart, so of course he questioned Ben's claim. He needed to do this, though. Jason needed to live for himself and risk the happiness he had in the hope of gaining even more. Ben had learned that lesson and benefited from it. Jason should, too. The only problem was that Ben didn't actually want him to go. Maybe you should give this a try, he said, pulling out his phone again. Jason moved closer to see, seeming eager for a distraction. What were you writing about? All of it. Ben sat and patted the sand next to him so Jason would do the same. Then he unlocked the phone and handed it over. I started shortly after Tim and I got back together. I wanted to make sure I was doing the right thing, so I wrote out my thoughts. That meant delving into our past, and then what happened when we were apart. You're writing an entire book on your phone? No, Ben laughed. Normally it's my laptop, but I'm not writing a book. Am I? I don't know what I'm doing exactly, but it helps me gain perspective. When you get all the facts down, along with your feelings, it's easier to take a step back and see the whole picture. That might help you, too. At the very least, it's cheaper than therapy. Jason nodded. I'll try, but again, this raises the question of why you feel like you need therapy on your honeymoon. Oh. He looked to the water where Tim spread his arms wide and flopped backwards. William reacted with surprising speed, grabbing Tim and pulling him toward the shore only a demonstration of rescue swimmer techniques and not a real emergency. William got along great with Tim, which was crucial because he would probably become their son-in-law. Thank goodness. Not only because Ben liked him, but because William was just as physical as Tim. Ben could never keep up with all the jogging and weightlifting and Tim's need to wear himself out every day. Only in the bedroom were they evenly matched. The thought made him smile. Ben was happy, truly so. He had a new husband, a cozy home, and a growing family. Strange, then, that he still longed for more. I've got a lot of years ahead of me, he said, trying to enunciate the yearning inside. Four decades, maybe more. What am I supposed to do with all that time? The same thing you're doing now. Jason replied. He didn't sound certain, which showed that he was growing up. Jason was right to doubt the status quo. Ten years ago, Ben's life had been completely different. And yet it had been strangely similar. Ben had just gotten married then and was looking toward the future with bright hopes and unshakable optimism. Maybe he had done some growing up, too because Ben no longer assumed that everything would work out okay. Whatever the future held, he would have to be on his guard and strive to ensure things went the way he wanted. But first he had to figure out exactly what that was. Starting now. His heart's desire was for Jason to stay. 
but it was the job of any good parent to know when to push a baby bird from the nest. Only then would his son learn to fly. Honeymoon, I freaking love my honeymoon. Tim sang this as he strutted into the bedroom. His shorts were somewhere else in the suite, tossed carelessly on the floor, no doubt, and his tank top was being pulled over his head seductively. That was the intent, at least. He tripped over the clothes Ben had abandoned on the carpet. Okay, so he shouldn't judge. But Tim managed to recover before falling. The shirt came off the rest of the way, mussing the black hair and making his doofy expression all that much more endearing. Of course, it didn't hurt that Tim was left wearing only a pair of maroon boxer briefs. Ben watched all of this while sitting up in bed. Sheets bundled around his waist and an open book in his lap. He did his best not to look impressed. Fun fact, Tim said, hands gripping the ornate footboard of the bed. Nookie is guaranteed every night of a honeymoon. Oh, really? Ben said, making sure he didn't sound convinced. Yup. Matter of fact, it's the law. It's definitely not. Maybe not back in the United States, Tim said, but here in Mexico, it's different. Seriously. Ben crossed his arms over his chest. You're full of it. I'm not. What's this law called? Es puro cuento, Tim said without hesitation. Ben let his arms drop. Really? That's a law. Tim smirked. Yeah, but I understand if you need a break. Not everyone can keep up with the Y machine. The Y machine? Ben repeated incredulously. How long did it take you to come up with that? It's a work in progress. Tim said, making his pecs bounce. Do you think Wyman machine sounds better? Or I was trying to think of some way to use the man part, like I put the man into Wyman. How about I put my man part into Wyman instead? Ben teased. Not a chance, Tim said. There's an American law that says you have to. It is our honeymoon. Maybe it's time we switch things up. Tim was barely paying attention. He snapped his fingers like he'd come up with a good idea. Then he turned his back to Ben, hooked his thumbs in the band of his underwear, and looked over his shoulder. Honey? Yes? Moon! The underwear came down. Ben got the joke and shook his head. I'm so glad I married a frat boy. I bet you are. Tim said, sauntering toward his side of the bed, naked now and increasingly hard. Isn't that every gay guy's fantasy? Not all of them, maybe, but the quiet, bookish types who don't have muscles of their own and wish they could find out what they feel like. Okay, that is pretty hot, Ben said, pulling down the blanket so Tim could climb inside. Although, outside the bedroom, those bookish types like meaningful conversations. About art? Tim asked, sliding between the sheets. Or architecture? Or how about a lecture on Mexican culture? Ben grinned. You're the complete package, baby. He leaned over for a kiss. Tim reciprocated, scooting nearer. So, who are you in the mood for tonight? Tim the artist or Tim the frat boy? The frat boy, but Ben hesitated. Do you think it went okay with William today? Tim shook his head, not understanding. Is this about our bet to see who could eat the most ceviche? I know we looked like pigs, but you saw how Jason couldn't stop laughing, especially when I coughed and an entire shrimp came flying out, which, now that I think about it, wasn't very classy. Sorry. It's fine, Ben said with a smile. I love all your different sides, and I know you tipped the waitress well. She was a good sport. Yeah. Ben took a deep breath. 
I meant when you and William were alone. When you were out swimming or went for that bike ride together, did he say anything about him and Jason having problems? Tim scooted down to rest his head on Ben's stomach while still looking up at him. Nope. He kept talking about their Oregon plans. He's really excited about the move. Why? Is everything okay? I don't know, Ben admitted. We shouldn't say anything, but Jason is acting like he's changed his mind. About the proposal or Oregon? I think he wants to stay in Texas. With William? Yeah. Tim looked confused. But what about... I know. Oregon is a good idea, isn't it? William can return to active duty and be close to his daughter, and Jason... Ben exhaled. Tell me he needs to broaden his horizons. He needs to broaden his horizons, Tim said earnestly, pushing himself up on an elbow. This is about us, isn't it? Jason doesn't want to leave us behind. Exactly, Ben said, not hiding his surprise. Did he talk to you about it, too? No, but... Whenever we hug lately, he's got a death grip on me. I could barely breathe the last time. I thought it was him being excited about the adoption, but then I caught him looking at you the other day when we were out shopping. He was staring across the store at you like his heart was about to break. Stop, Ben said, feeling like his own was also in danger of cracking. All of this is normal, Tim said. When I left Kansas... Bad example. I couldn't wait to get out of there because I didn't have any friends left. Same when I left Houston, but I still felt sad about leaving you behind. I know we hadn't talked for a year at that point, but just the idea that we would be even farther apart made me sad. Sometimes you feel the distance even when you're still close. Ben reached for him, so Tim flopped back down, using him as a pillow again and grinning while Ben stroked his hair. I suppose I felt that way before I moved to Chicago. It seemed like a really good idea until a few days before it was time to leave. Then I panicked. Jason is feeling the same thing, Tim said. He'll keep freaking out and we'll keep reassuring him. No way is he letting William get away. Not this time. You've seen them together. Remind you of anyone? Ben chuckled, causing Tim's head to rise and fall. You're right. I'm worrying for nothing. Exactly. I'll be sure to talk to him anyway, just to make sure he knows it will always be there for him. Ben felt a swell of emotion. You're the best. You know that? Tim grinned in response. No, but I sure like hearing it. Remind me, what was that honeymoon law called? No hay nadie más guapo que tú, Tim said, eyes smoldering as he pushed himself up again. Ben peered at him. Is that what you said before? It sounded different this time. No more talking, Tim said, face moving closer. Silver eyes locked onto his, and Ben knew he couldn't resist them, so instead he closed his own. When their lips met, he felt like he could melt into those arms and spend the rest of the trip tangled up in the sheets, or at least the rest of the night, which is exactly what they did. Honey freaking moon! At times, the thought had Tim blissed out. He was married to Benjamin. It didn't seem all that long ago that his chances seemed ruined. Life was full of surprises, though, not all of them bad, because here they were on their honeymoon. Acapulco might not enjoy the glamorous reputation it once had, but Tim still adored it. He made sure they got the most out of the trip, dragging them up to the Chapel of Peace for tranquility and the breathtaking view, and down to Zocalo for the flea market stalls and restaurants, 
Ben seemed to enjoy himself, as did Jason and William, but Tim still worried it wasn't enough. This wasn't Ben's first marriage, nor his first honeymoon. Normally that didn't bother Tim, but at times he found it hard to compete. Acapulco versus Paris. Man. Then again, he was pretty sure that Paris didn't have gorgeous beaches, or nearly as much sunshine. As for the food, considering that they both had simple tastes, Ben had to prefer enchilada suizas over snails or whatever. Hopefully. But when it came to culture... Tim knew that Paris had most cities beat. The cabarets, art museums, fashion boutiques, rivers, and of course a certain famous tower. Both cities offered interesting architecture, but Acapulco had been hit hard by a hurricane the year before and was still recovering. Then there were local issues with drug violence. More than once, Ben had read aloud a news headline, then looked to him in concern. Tim stuck to the same answer each time. Acapulco is a great place full of good people. He was determined to prove that. Visits to the local museums helped prove that this too was a city rich with culture, and a few hours spent at El Fuerte de San Diego, a fort built to protect the port from pirates, asserted Acapulco's historical significance. Still, those lingering doubts persisted, when Tim took Ben to a giant mosaic dragon, a mural by Diego Rivera, they marveled over the colors and symbolism. But could it really compete with the Mona Lisa? Tim knew which piece of art he preferred, but one was a household name and more likely to be bragged about when they returned home again. Having fun? Tim asked. They had taken a bus close to La Quebrada to see the cliff-diving spectacle there, but first they had done some shopping and explored the local neighborhoods. Today was their last day in Acapulco, and he intended to make it memorable. As they walked toward the cliffs, he couldn't help noticing that Ben was quiet, so he asked why. I'm good, Ben said, expression pensive. Just a little tired. Want me to carry you? Never mind, why am I even asking? Tim moved like he was going to pick Ben up. His boyfriend, no, his husband, protested and shoved him away while laughing. At least his smile had returned. You can carry me, Jason said from behind them. You've got your own muscle, Tim said over his shoulder. Ask him. I don't mind, William said shielding his eyes to look at Jason. But only if I can use you as an umbrella. Actually, do we have any sunblock left? They had already gone through an entire bottle, Jason lubing up William at frequent intervals. At first, Tim thought this was an excuse for them to get touchy-feely, but William was fair-skinned and had grown increasingly red as the trip went on. We're out, Jason grumbled. How much farther? Where's that water you promised? Ben murmured to himself. Could we walk in the shade? William asked. If there's any around here, that is. Crap! The trip was a disaster. If they had gone to Paris, they would probably be riding in a horse-drawn carriage while feeding macaroons to each other between sips of champagne. Tim looked around and spotted a convenience store ahead. He could already hear the rumble of an overworked air conditioner. The interior seemed nice and dark. Follow me, he said, picking up the pace. Twenty minutes later, the situation was much improved. Everyone had a cold drink, Jason had smeared half a bottle of newly purchased sunscreen on William, and a taxi had just pulled up to carry them the rest of the way. This is really nice, William said, once they were all crammed inside. Hard to imagine how it could get any better. Tim said, leaning forward to check on his husband. Not that he was in the front seat. Jason had called shotgun. The rest of them were in the back. William insisted on being in the middle, which didn't make sense because Ben was the smallest and would have fit better there. And that would have allowed Tim to snuggle with him a little. Instead, William was grinning while glancing back and forth between them. He tended to get a little excited when around them both. 
Tim thought it was sweet. You okay, babe? William opened his mouth like he was about to answer, then turned even redder and leaned back so Tim could see across the seat. Ben smiled, appearing more relaxed. This is nice. Can we have him drive around for the next half hour? Tim was sure it was a joke, but after checking his watch, he saw that they still had plenty of time. He asked the driver to take the most scenic route possible. They drove through crowded commercial areas and neighborhoods with narrow, winding streets, the day-to-day -day stress outside the car not touching them inside their bubble. By the time they reached the destination and climbed out of the taxi, they were all eager to stretch their legs. Just a short walk brought them to the cliffs, a breeze cooling them along the way. Most tourists watched the spectacle from the patio of a nearby restaurant, but Tim guided his family to a platform lower down. From there, they had a better view and a finer appreciation for the height of the cliffs, which stretched craggy and unforgiving toward the sky. The rocky wall directly ahead of them sloped outward the further it went, ending in a pool of frothy, churning water, azure waves rushing in from the Pacific. Five dark-haired heads could be seen floating below. The performers. Tim made sure that everyone was pressed against the rail for the best view, then pointed as the five bodies below swam for the cliffs and began climbing. They're barefoot, Ben gasped. They should be using climbing gear, William said with concern. Harnesses, helmets, gloves. Take it easy, Coast Guard, Tim said, beaming at the display. They know what they're doing. They're pretty hot, Jason added. They definitely were. Brown muscles glistened and strained as each person continued to climb. Two stopped at a lower outcrop, walked to the very end of the ledge, and looked down. Even there, they were well above eye level. They're not going to jump, Ben cried. They'll hit the rocks. Only if they get the timing wrong, Tim said. They have to wait until a wave comes in or the water below isn't deep enough. I'm calling the Mexican Coast Guard, William said. What's their number? Just watch, Tim said, nodding as one of the performers raised his hands above his head in a classic dive position. Then he jumped, managed a flip, and plummeted toward certain doom. A wave rushed in to catch him at the last second, but was the water deep enough? The audience breathed out in shared relief when the diver surfaced again unharmed. This was repeated by the second performer, then all attention went to the very top of the cliff, which was twice as high. Ben grabbed Tim's arm, clutching him close. Tim allowed himself a satisfied smirk. Acapulco was pretty damn cool. All three performers at the top of the cliff jumped at once, tumbling through the air like they had been cast out of heaven. One flipped twice. The other two seemed intent on belly flops. But as the water neared, they straightened and entered like a syringe plunging into skin. That's beautiful, William breathed. It scared the hell out of me, but it's beautiful. You've jumped from higher than that, Jason said, right? No way, William said, looking wide-eyed as the performers started climbing again. What is that, a hundred feet? More? Yeah, but you jumped from a helicopter, Jason said. William shook his head. Only after it descends as close to the water as possible. It's still cooler, Jason said, unwilling to admit that William was anything less than amazing. His eyes were shining, even as the show went on, but the smile faded when he looked instead at Ben, and then at him. Tim offered a reassuring smile, trying to show that it was okay. Jason returned the gesture, but without as much certainty. Tim led by example and turned his attention back to the show. They experienced vicarious jolts of panic and spikes of adrenaline while watching, and when the demonstration finally ceased, they all felt like they had narrowly escaped death, despite having only been in the audience. 
Tim made sure they stuck around long enough afterwards to tip the divers and to translate because William had a slew of questions for them. Despite his initial concerns, it was clear that his future son-in-law had enjoyed himself. Tim hoped that Ben had, too. What did you think? he asked as they were walking away. I loved it, Ben admitted. But if you ever try anything like that, I'll kill you. I don't care if that makes sense or not. Tim laughed. Fair enough. What now? It's a little early, but we could grab dinner. This resulted in a chorus of not hungries. I wouldn't mind going back to the hotel, Ben said. We can rest, refresh, and then go out. Tim summoned another taxi to make this wish a reality. Once they were in the hotel lobby, they consulted each other for direction. The pool here has a high dive, doesn't it? William asked. Saw that coming, Jason said. Looks like we're going swimming. Again. Don't you ever get tired of the water? It's like that movie Splash, Ben said. Tim laughed. The other two looked at them blankly. Daryl Hannah, Ben tried. She's a mermaid who goes to the city and gets legs, but she has to soak in a bathtub occasionally to stay healthy. Must be before our time, Jason said with a snort. Whatever, Ben said. I'm sure it'll get remade soon enough, and then you can see it. That's right, Tim said, backing him up. We actually had original ideas back in our day. Jason held up a palm. You guys have fun watching silent movies in your room. We're going swimming. Tim waited until he and Ben were in the elevator alone before he laughed. I love that boy. I do too, Ben said. I'm so glad we brought them with us. Me too. Although, privacy is nice. Yes, Ben said wistfully. It can be. Looks like they would indeed be having sex every day of their honeymoon. Not that Tim was keeping track. Okay, he was. He knew quality beat quantity, but he was thrilled nonetheless. Except when they got back to their room, Ben turned around at the door like someone saying goodnight at the end of a date. I think I need a little Daryl Hannah time, he said. You want a bath? Yeah. Yeah. Tim nodded. No problem, I'll run one for you. Ben remained motionless. Oh, Tim said. You need some alone time. Just a little, Ben said. The quiet sounds good. That way I'm ready for tonight. Tim wanted to pout and beg for sex, or at least ask to sit on the toilet and keep Ben company but he had learned that the payoff was double if he played it cool, even if that wasn't his first instinct. No problem, he said. I'll join the boys at the pool. No flips or anything fancy, Ben scolded. Tim just grinned. If Ben didn't love him, he wouldn't be so worried all the time. Enjoy yourself, he said, stealing a kiss. I'll see you in an hour. Before he left, he changed into his swimsuit, which involved walking into the bathroom naked to fetch it from the shower rod where he had hung it to dry. He could have gotten it before undressing, but he wanted to remind Ben of what he was missing. He hoped it worked like subliminal advertising. A flash of the wiener now might lead to a trip to the concession stand later for a hot dog. After leaving the hotel room, Tim banished such thoughts from his mind and instead looked forward to diving into cool water. Texas was hot, but Mexico was hotter, and even he was getting a little tired of the sun. He took the stairs instead of waiting for the elevator, only hesitating when nearing the indoor pool. What if Jason and William were enjoying their privacy? Without the parents around, so to speak. Tim shook his head, nothing figurative about it. He was a parent now, meaning his presence was probably a big downer. The door to the pool area had a diamond-shaped window, so he peeked through it. William was climbing the ladder to the diving board. Jason was sitting on one of the deck chairs, skin and hair dry despite wearing swim trunks. 
Buds were in his ears, the green wires snaking down to his phone, which was no doubt streaming a horror movie or maybe a YouTube video. Future, meet your past, because the scene wasn't so different from what he and Ben often did. Hanging out together while engaged in separate tasks, although Ben would be reading by the pool instead of watching videos. No longer feeling he would ruin a romantic moment, Tim pushed open the door. Jason wasn't surprised to see him, nodding before looking back at his phone. William's reaction was a little more enthusiastic, a sheepish grin followed by blushing cheeks. On this trip, he had done the same thing every time Tim showed up in a swimsuit. The reaction was flattering, and frankly, if Tim wasn't already happily married and Jason wasn't so in love with William, he would have no trouble returning the attention. As it was, he considered whatever fleeting attraction William had as harmless and cute. Learn any tricks while watching those divers? he asked. William perked up. They make it look easy, don't they? I tried doing a flip and failed miserably. Just takes practice, Tim said. We can do it. They had a few false starts, Tim landing on his back for one of them, which smarted. He got it on the next try, realizing that he just needed a lot of bounce. This was less intimidating on the low dive. He managed to flip on three separate attempts, each easier than the previous. Then he coached William until he too was able to do it. I'm surprised they don't teach you this in the Coast Guard, Tim said when climbing out. Diving boards and helicopters don't mix, William retorted. Not unless you're looking for a haircut. Maybe we should try it from the high dive, Tim suggested. I'm game, William replied, grinning at him. This earned them a small audience. Jason rose and walked closer to take photos and record a video. A handful of little kids sat on the edge of the pool and clapped or called out numbers, like scorecards from an Olympic judge. Nueve! Cinco! Ocho! Or if they were really lucky, Diez! 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 Even a backflip didn't earn them a perfect score. Only a cannonball would do the trick, the kids giggling if they got splashed enough. Or once, William kept jumping up and down on the board until he had a ridiculous amount of air. Tim was certain he almost hit the ceiling. Eventually, the kids got tired of sitting on the sidelines and started participating, but on the lower diving board instead. Only one of them was brave enough to attempt the high dive. He just happened to be the smallest one, too. The kid couldn't have been more than six years old. Tim stood on the sidelines and watched, unsure if he should feel impressed or concerned. He looked over, trying to find the parents, and saw a woman on her cell phone. She seemed to be arguing with someone about a travel reservation. Then she looked up and shrieked. Tim followed her eyes, turning just in time to see the little kid plummet toward the water. The boy hadn't dived or pulled his limbs in. He looked more like a skydiver, arms and legs spread wide. Not good. The boy hit the water face down and flat, a painful smacking sound echoing throughout the hall. He didn't come up again, not quickly enough. Tim braced himself to dive in, but a blur blew past him before he could. William shot beneath the water like a torpedo, only breaking the surface again when a small bundle was in his arms. Then he began swimming backward, dragging the child along, just like he had demonstrated to him the other day. Tim got down on his knees so he could pull the child free from the water, wishing desperately that he had refreshed himself on CPR because the kid was making a terrible choking noise. Then the boy started coughing instead, thank goodness. Me baby, me pobre baby. The mother rushed to her child. Tim made room for her and turned to William, who was out of the pool and looking like he meant business. He's okay, Tim informed him. He's breathing. He just got the wind knocked out of him, William said. Same thing happened to me once. The mother turned, spluttering emotional thank yous. Tim translated for William, who had some emotional words of his own. They were politely phrased and softly spoken, but ultimately boiled down to the mother needing to keep a closer watch on her child. That was less fun to translate, but the woman took it well, 
thanking him again. Then she alternated between scolding her son and smooching the boy on his cheeks. Tim chuckled at this display, then looked over to check on his own son. Jason was standing there, shocked and pale. Tim thought he knew why, but he waited until they were upstairs in the hall before he said anything. William had slipped into his room, Jason about to follow when Tim grabbed his arm. Hey, just a sec. Jason looked surprised, then murmured something to William before pulling the door mostly shut. What's up? Funny how life works, Tim said. Sometimes it sends you a sign too clear to ignore. Jason searched his eyes. Ben told you. Telling one of us is telling the other, Tim said, unless you swear me to secrecy. Jason exhaled. I know that I need to let him go. Right. William belongs in the Coast Guard where he can keep helping people, Tim said, and you need to go with him for support. But Ben and I have each other, Tim said. You made sure of that by forcing us to get married. He leaned forward and in a conspiring whisper added, And I'm really glad you did. Jason flashed a smile. It had to happen eventually. Yeah, you've taken good care of us. We'll miss you, but we won't be lonely. Now it's your turn to figure out who you want to spend the rest of your life with. I already have, Jason said. Then on to step two, which is actually spending your life with him. You'll see us again, a lot. We won't let you get away that easily. Jason just stared. When his lips started trembling, Tim grabbed him in a bear hug. You're doing the right thing. Don't let fear trip you up. Trust me. I speak from experience. Jason nodded against his shoulder, then sniffed and pulled away. I'll try. That's my boy, Tim said, ruffling his hair. Send me a text when you guys are ready, and we'll end this trip with the biggest meal you've ever seen. Bring a bucket to barf in, because it's going to be ridiculous. And suddenly I'm not feeling so hungry, Jason said, shaking his head. But he smiled and looked as though a weight had been lifted from his shoulders. Reassured that he would always have a home, hopefully now he would focus on creating one of his own. Chapter 2 Home Again Ben fumbled for the right key, already missing the sound of claws on linoleum from beyond the door. And if he was missing Chinchilla, that meant, Maybe I should go pick her up real quick. Tim grabbed the luggage, ready to enter, but looked with transparent longing toward the drive that led away from their house. Allison's got her hands full already with Davis. She might have forgotten that we're home today. She's stopping by later, Ben said, opening the door, although only a crack, force of habit. When he remembered that no overexcited dog was going to make a break for it, he opened it the rest of the way. The air that drifted out, despite being a little stale, smelled reassuringly familiar. For the previous six years, it had been home, Good memories had been made here, and a few bad ones, too, but mostly the house hidden away on the outskirts of Austin had been his sanctuary, which he never expected to find again after... Hey, Tim said before Ben could enter. Quick question. Ben turned to face him. What's up? Tim's smile was unusually bashful. Is it always going to feel like this? Ben shook his head, not understanding. What do you mean? Being married. The wedding was way better than I expected. Now I wish we had done it sooner. The honeymoon was awesome. I liked it too. Ben had felt a little worn out at the end, but not in a bad way. Yeah, I just didn't think it was possible to love you more than I already did. So are we just riding a high, or is... It always going to be like this. You've been married before. I figured you would know. 
Ben thought about mornings spent at a small kitchen table, the sound of a laugh that he still missed, and a hand that always sought out his before they fell asleep at night. That's up to us, he said, a little misty-eyed. It's our job now to hold on to this feeling for as long as we can. I won't let you down. Ben smiled. You're adorable. Hey, do you remember our first day here? How you wanted to carry me across the threshold? You wouldn't let me, Tim said. Then he perked up. You said it was marriage stuff. Did I? Ben said demurely. Tim dropped the luggage. Ben was pretty sure he heard a souvenir breaking, but he didn't care. He was already laughing as Tim scooped him up, chest puffed up with pride as he sauntered into the house. Sure, he misjudged and bumped Ben's head against the doorframe, but love hurt sometimes. Tim set him down in the entryway and they kissed. But before it could turn into anything more, they both pulled away. It's muggy in here, Tim said. Ben nodded. I'll turn up the air. Married life, so perfectly domestic. Tim brought their suitcases inside and shut the door. And when Ben was done fiddling with the thermostat, they went together to the living room. He watched as Tim walked to the sliding glass door and peered out at the backyard. It's bad enough that Jason doesn't live here anymore, he said. Without chinchilla, it doesn't feel like home. Empty nesters, Ben said. I'm sure it won't be long before someone shows up. Speaking of which, when does Marcello get back in town? Uh, I don't remember exactly, Tim admitted. He could be back already. They looked at each other and grinned. Should we check the Marcello detection device? Ben asked. Tim nodded and they hurried to the kitchen. They had spent the last ten days out of town, so there was no reason that any of their friends should have stopped by, but when they checked the refrigerator, sure enough, something had changed. I like how he left the bottle in there, Tim said, holding up the champagne, even though the cork is gone and it's empty. He could fit four of this house into his own, Ben said, shaking his head. Why would he need to come here when he already has everything? Probably likes going through our underwear drawers, Tim murmured. Hey, there's an idea. We'll put champagne bottles in our underwear drawers and see how long they last. I'd rather not know, Ben said, filling the electric kettle to make tea. Tim was still poking around in the refrigerator, looking unsatisfied. We need fresh stuff. I want to start juicing more, as in smoothies. We don't get enough fruit. Too easy. Ben said. Want to hit the store? I was planning on unpacking and doing some laundry. I'll run then, Tim said, shutting the fridge. Okay. Ben made sure to keep his tone neutral, even though he really liked the idea, because there was something he wanted to do. A thought had been nagging him for the last two weeks, but he needed to be alone for it. Probably. Tim was cool about everything these days, but Ben would feel a lot less silly without an audience. He started the first load of laundry, straining to hear over the sound of the washer filling. When the front door closed and the buzz of an engine faded away, he went to peek out the entryway windows. No sign of Tim. Ben almost wished that the car would return because now he felt nervous. Then again, how bad could this possibly go? unless objects started floating around the room and smashing into things. But even that would be welcome, because at least he would be here. Ben went upstairs to the office. Tim rarely used it, preferring to work in his studio, which was now a converted shed elsewhere on the property. That meant the office was mostly Ben's. That's not why the framed photo was kept there. He wasn't hiding it away, although he did move it out of the bedroom because it was awkward to be in the heat of the moment and look over to see that face again. Too awkward, and at times too tempting, but no fantasy could ever count as cheating, not when it involved him. Ben sat in the office chair and faced a framed photo on the desk. It showed a flight attendant looking debonair in his uniform. 
The man's eyes shone with pride, love, and everything else good that he had embodied. Hello, Jace. Ben choked back tears and shook his head. Sorry. I know you don't like it when I cry. At least, I know you wouldn't have liked it. Oh, this is stupid. He looked away, but only for a second. Then his attention returned to the photo and a few small knickknacks he kept next to it. Reminders. One was the name tag Jace had worn while working, which, by coincidence, shared the same name as his son. Jason. Later, the airline had changed their policy and allowed Jace to use the name everyone called him, but Ben kept this one for sentimental reasons. Jace had been wearing it when they met. Ben caressed the name tag with the tip of a finger, looking next to the ceramic fortune cookie that Jace had never seen with living eyes, but that Ben had bought because it always made his heart fill with affection. Now was no different. Sorry, Ben said, addressing the photo again. You know, I don't usually do this. I just really need to tell you something, and I'm not sure where else to go. I thought about flying out to Warrensburg, but... Ben shook his head to clear it. I got married. Tim and I, obviously. I know you didn't want me to be alone. You also wanted me to be happy, and I really am. Ben wiped tears from his eyes. I can imagine how this looks, but I mean it. I'm doing really well, even though I wish you were still here. No idea how that would work but you always said that emotions didn't have to make sense. I just want you to know that we're still married. Ben held up his left hand where he had been wearing the same ring for ten years. Tim's okay with that. He gets it. It makes me a bigamist, but I don't care. I love you. I will always be your husband, no matter what. Try as he might, he couldn't help sobbing a few times. Then he got himself under control. Ben forced himself to think of the happy memories they had made together. Feeling better, he grabbed the framed photo, kissed it, and set it down again. Then he rose, walked to the door, and looked back with his hand on the light switch. I love you, Jace. If you're out there, I hope you can feel that. He waited for an answer, just in case, and when it didn't come, he turned off the light and went back downstairs to continue his life. And the laundry. Ben went to answer the door, hearing muffled thumps and a few choice cuss words. When he opened the door, Allison stood there, looking disheveled. A leash was twisted around her ankles and a squirming baby wiggled from one arm or a toddler, technically speaking, because Davis was officially mobile. Currently, he was reaching for the dog at Allison's feet, his hands opening and closing as he burbled something. He could speak, although Ben always wished the kid came with subtitles because he never understood a word. Is he saying, gimme? Ben asked, or live meat? He's saying he wants you to grab him before I fall over. Oh, sorry. Ben took Davis, who looked extremely offended by this, and quickly worked himself up into tears. Uh, he's fine, Allison said, twisting around until she was free of the leash. Then she brushed past him. Air conditioning, she moaned. Ours broke down yesterday. Wow, that sucks, he said over the sound of wailing. Can we switch? She handed him the leash and took Davis, walking with her son deeper into the house. Ben shut the door, then squatted to set Chinchilla loose. The dog wagged her stubby tail, noticed Davis watching her, and fled. Ben had never seen her move so fast as she disappeared around a corner. I think she likes it better at Marcello's place, Allison said. I know he was in Japan, but doesn't he have... I don't know, servants who could have taken care of her? Blame Tim, Ben said, 
He wanted her to be with someone she knows, so... He winced because the wailing continued. Would orange juice help? You could shove an entire dinner roll in there and it wouldn't make a difference, Allison said. Do you have a full-length mirror? He's really into his own reflection lately. In our bedroom, Ben said. They made their way upstairs. Sure enough, when Allison set Davis on the carpet in front of the mirror, he was instantly mesmerized. Thank God, Allison said, sitting on the edge of the mattress. It's a testament to the power of love that I would lay down my life for this little beast. In fact, I'm pretty sure he'll be what kills me, and soon. Ben plopped down next to her. You'll be fine, he said warmly. Admit it, you love every second you get to spend with him. True, Allison said instantly. Twisted, but definitely true. So, anyway, tell me everything about the honeymoon. He did, even pulling out his phone to show her photos and videos. And while she was interested, she seemed to be expecting more. He soon found out why. So everything is okay? He nodded happily. Yep. Are you sure? Ben shrugged. Yeah. No problems you need to discuss with me? You're not struggling with being married to someone other than Jace? You're not second-guessing yourself or putting Tim through unfair comparisons? Nope, I've got it all under control. Allison narrowed her eyes. Where is my best friend, and what have you done with him? Ben laughed. He's right here. You're not my therapist. Could have fooled me, Allison said. I don't like this. You're supposed to be the troubled and tortured one, not me. Are there problems you need to tell me about? Ben inquired. Go on. Pretend this bed is one of those therapy couches. Allison grinned, kicked off her sandals, and scooted back on the bed so she could recline. I like this. Let's see. What sort of troubles do I have? Ben sat on the edge of the mattress and angled himself so he could still see her. What about your son? He's perfect, Allison said dismissively. Ben nodded, pretending his palm was a notebook that he was writing in. Patient is in denial. When she looked like she wanted to pounce, he quickly added, Because nobody is perfect, although Davis is really, really close. This pacified her enough that he could continue. Let's talk about your relationship. Brian? Allison asked. Yes! We're overdue a bitching session about our spouses. Okay, let's see. Her tongue was sticking out of the corner of her mouth as she tried to dredge up something bad about one of the nicest guys in the world. I know. You won't believe what he said to me the other day. We were getting busy for the first time in weeks, and he comes at me with the following line. She held up her hands. Brace yourself. He said, We don't have to have sex, honey. We can cuddle instead. Ben scribbled furiously in his imaginary notebook. Was he having performance issues? No, he never does. We were both riled up and ready to go, so what the hell? Her eyes shot over to where Davis was smearing the mirror with clammy hands. Heck, what the heck? Tim said the same thing to me once, Ben admitted. The timing was strange, too, because he was practically humping my leg. Practically? Okay, literally. But I'm sure he meant well. I think our guys are just trying to tell us that even though they love bedroom time, what they feel for us goes beyond the sexual, you know? Like, they would still want us, even without the sex. For most guys, I think that's a big deal. That might be true, Allison retorted, but I want Brian to want me. I want him to go crazy and beg if I'm holding back the cookie jar. Not that I ever would. Cookie jar? 
Ben repeated with a grimace. Oh, stop. How many of your weird terms have I had to hear over the years, especially with Tim? What did you call it? He's on the metric system? The European standard, Ben said with an embarrassed chuckle, and I didn't make that one up. You sure liked repeating it. Ben eagerly changed the subject. You and I have it good, don't we? Oh, absolutely, Allison said, stifling a yawn. We have the best men imaginable, and now that we've settled down, we get to kick back and enjoy the rest of our lives with them. It's the rest part that I've been thinking about lately. Ben abandoned playing therapist so he could scoot onto bed with her. We've both been through a lot since we were teenagers. Now it feels like all the drama is over, and I'm asking myself, what comes next? Everything feels so stable. I'm not used to that and don't know what to do. Enjoy it, Allison suggested. And speak for yourself. My life consists of daily drama, she sat upright. You should adopt again. A baby this time. Can you imagine? We'll raise our children together. How cute would that be? He leaned forward to check on Davis, who was now licking the mirror. I'm not sure I'm ready. We're still focused on Jason and trying to figure all of that out. Smart decision, Allison said, relaxing again. I just wanted someone to commiserate with. We could still share the experience. How about you start babysitting Davis overnight? That way we can compare notes and I could get some sleep. I'm up for that, Ben said. Do you want to take a nap? No, Allison said, but her eyes were closed. Maybe just for a few minutes. Ben smiled and slid off the bed. He approached Davis, who looked at him warily like he was ready and willing to start crying without further notice. Hey, little guy, Ben tried, reaching for him. How would you like to go downstairs for a pudding cup? The face started to crumple. We could share it with Chinchilla, he added, mentally apologizing to the dog. How's that sound? Do you want to help me give Chinchilla a treat? Davis reconsidered, his face breaking out into a gap-toothed grin. Instead of picking him up, Ben offered his hand and helped him stand. Take a nap, he said to Allison. We'll be okay. His friend didn't respond. She was already softly snoring. Ben considered her fondly. Then he recorded a quick video to humiliate her with later, because that's what friends were for. Goodbye. Tim hadn't expected that they would need to say it so soon. Just a month after the honeymoon, he and Ben were at the airport, hanging back to give Jason and William their privacy. Waiting with them was Kate, William's mother, who was already dabbing at tears. The young lovers stood in front of the security checkpoint, oblivious to the people impatiently swarming around them to reach their gates. I should have kept making babies, Kate said. I should have made as many as his body could handle and homeschooled them all. If I had it to do over, I'd never let them leave the house. The funny thing was, Tim could relate. He didn't want Jason to go and was thankful that day hadn't yet come. William was flying ahead to Astoria to set up their new life. Once he had, he would send for Jason. Just the idea tugged at his heartstrings. He could only imagine how much worse it was for Kate, who had carried a child for nine months and raised him every day for eighteen years and beyond. Tim was surprised how quickly a stranger had become family. He had always assumed that if someone were adopted, the child would need to be young for any sort of bond to form. This wasn't the case. He didn't care how ridiculous anyone found it. Jason was his son. I was thinking about locking ours in his room, Ben confided, just for a few years, maybe a decade or two. Then we'll let him out. K 
kidnapping my own child, Kate said. Now, why didn't I think of that? It's good you didn't, Ben said, or William wouldn't have saved all those lives. You must be proud. Prouder than I ever imagined, Kate said, eyes watery as she watched her son. That has made every second of missing and worrying about him worth it. He'll be fine, Tim said. Good heart, good head, and man, can he swim. The person in question looked in their direction, then waved them over. They walked as a group, Tim focusing on Jason, who appeared absolutely miserable. While the other two were busy saying goodbye to William, Tim moved closer to his son. You'll be all right, he said, putting an arm around Jason. Just think of last time. You were facing four years of being apart. This time it'll be, what? A month, maybe two, William said, having overheard. I'll get things figured up out there, and then... He smiled, waiting for a response. Jason had a harder time matching his expression. Then I'll fly to you, and we'll be together. Exactly, William said coming in for a hug. Tim started to move away, but one of those big, pale arms pulled him close as well. The rest of you get in here, too, William said. We're all family now, or will be soon, right? This was directed at Jason, who laughed and clamped his mouth shut with a shake of his head. This was a running joke between the two. Ever since William had proposed... Jason had declined to give his answer until four years were up, wanting to be certain. William didn't seem to mind, playfully attempting to find out sooner, despite everyone knowing what his answer would be. When it did happen, that would likely take their lives in all sorts of directions. For now, things were still simple, and Tim was content to wait, preferring to bask in the sensation of them all being together while he still could. Don't be mad at me. Tim looked up from the painting he was working on, surprised by the figure standing in the doorway. Any visitor was unusual. Since he had bought the shed and converted it to a studio with William's help, it had become a private sanctuary. Ben occasionally poked his head in, asking if he was hungry or to let him know he was going somewhere. More often, he texted, not wanting to disturb Tim's work. This was beneficial to his art, since interruptions could throw him off, although the current visitor was just what he needed. Stay there, he said to Jason, eyes darting over the silhouette of a body framed by outside light. He was tempted to take a photo, but that felt like cheating. Instead, he checked the canvas. The painting was of Jason standing much like he was now. William was down on one knee, holding up a life-saving medallion instead of a ring. The backdrop was an airport, rather than their yard where the proposal had actually taken place. Tim wanted to superimpose the two events. The security checkpoint was represented by lifeless gray lines, the impassive crowd of travelers a blur of color moving around the only two static figures. One more second, he said looking up again and making a quick adjustment. Okay. Jason came the rest of the way inside, closing the door behind him. He looked around the space, no doubt taking in the mess of canvases, paint tubes, and drop cloths, but hey, that's what a studio was for. Behind him was the love seat where Tim sometimes napped and a giant set of flat file cabinets where he kept his best work. Jason moved closer, already straining his neck to see what he was working on, but Tim held up a hand to ward him off. Uh-uh. You know I don't let anyone see a work in progress. Jason rolled his eyes and smiled, but worry soon weighed down his expression. I need you to tell Ben something for me. Tim set his brush aside. Why? Because you know how. And because it's easier to tell you because you're not perfect like he is. 
No offense. None taken, Tim said with a chuckle. For the record, Ben isn't perfect. He just looks that way when compared to me. The joke fell flat, the worried expression persisting. So he added, What's going on? Jason broke eye contact. I wrote William a letter. Tim let this sink in. He considered different possibilities, but only one seemed likely. You're bailing on your plans? His son nodded. Jason, why? Because, Jason shot back, voice terse. He's where he needs to be, and so am I. Tim took a few deep breaths and shook his head. You're not. You really aren't. You might have a good life here, but... It's you, Jason said, voice cracking. And Ben, that's who I belong with. Really? Tim hated to do it, but he couldn't think of any better way of making his point. He grabbed the easel and turned it around so Jason could see the canvas. The bright blue eyes widened and filled with tears. That's who you belong with. Maybe not forever. Some relationships last, others don't. But until you've given it a shot, I bet you won't be happy. Jason shook his head. You don't understand. I do about this. Because I was dumb enough to say goodbye to Ben once, and I spent a long time regretting that decision. Don't make the same mistake. It's more complicated than that, Jason said, trying to glare his tears out of existence. Then we'll figure it out, Tim said, together. Until then, don't send the letter. Jason continued to glower. I already did. Last week. Do you know if he's gotten it? Jason nodded sullenly, pulled out his phone, and held it up. Tim came closer to read the screen. The most recent text from William was short. Four years. Tim sighed. He had already watched Jason go through a period of separation that long and had seen how miserable it made him. The clouds only disappeared when William returned for brief visits. Even when Jason had tried to move on and seemed to, he wasn't as happy. Not like he'd been during their most recent time together. We need to talk to Ben about this. Jason nodded. I couldn't figure out how to tell him. I figured... You've made a lot of mistakes. Thanks. Sorry, but you know the best way to do it without him getting mad. Tim thought about it. That usually involves me being shirtless, which somehow I don't think is going to work for you. Definitely not. He'll be upset, Tim said. But he won't be angry, I promise. You really should tell him yourself, but I suppose I can do it for you, just this once. Are you going to take your shirt off first? Oh, hell yes, Tim said. This one might require the full Monty. I'll tell him when I get out of the shower. Thanks. Jason nodded to the canvas. Do I really look so scrawny next to William? You compliment each other. You'll be depriving the world of something beautiful if you don't change your mind. Jason wasn't swayed. He could be stubborn, and when he was, nothing could move him. Not even Ben. For this situation, they would need reinforcements. Welcome to your... Allison sized them up. First of many family counseling sessions. Tim resisted a groan. Allison was rarely wrong, and while he wasn't looking forward to this becoming a regular occurrence, he would do whatever was necessary to get Jason's life back on track. Not that his son seemed pleased about the situation. There's going to be more than one of these, Jason complained, arms crossed over his chest. She's only kidding, Ben said calmly. Aren't you? 
I'm in for as many as it takes, Tim said. Jason slumped deeper into his chair. Some of us have to work. I work, Tim shot back. Who do you think is paying for this? He didn't mean it like that, Ben said. But your schedule is a lot more flexible than either of ours. And that means I shouldn't have a positive attitude? No, but you know he's only... A fluttering noise followed by a thwack attracted their attention. Allison had tossed her notebook into the air and it had landed in the center of the circle. Or the square, since there were four chairs, each facing the middle. That's better, Allison said, rising briefly to fetch the notebook. There aren't a lot of rules for what we're about to do. Don't interrupt when someone else is speaking. You'll each have your turn. The one exception is when this hand goes up. She raised it to demonstrate. That means you stop talking and listen to me. Any questions so far? They eyed each other and shook their heads. Good. Allison's lips twitched. One more thing before we begin. I just want to say how happy I am that things have returned to normal. I've been getting a lot more sleep lately, and Ben is back to needing me. Just how it's supposed to be. Are you seriously gloating? Ben asked, fighting down a smile of his own. Don't act like things are perfect at home. Brian told me that he's losing what little hair he's got left. Blame an excess of testosterone, not stress, Allison replied. I like my men virile. Are you saying mine's not? Because, guys, Tim said, can we focus? Professional, Allison murmured to herself. Right. Sorry. She cleared her throat. Now then, Jason, we're here because we all care about you. We have the best intentions, but only you get to decide what path your life takes. All we can do is offer our advice. With that in mind... Why don't you explain the situation to us? Jason's arms remained crossed, but now he seemed more like he was hugging himself. William moved to Oregon to return to active duty, which I want. I was supposed to go with him, but... His eyes darted first to Ben, then to Tim. My home is in Austin. One of your homes, Allison said. It's possible to have more than one. Ben and I are from the Woodlands, and even though we haven't lived there since our high school days, I still consider it home. Don't you? Yes, Ben said. Absolutely. Tim, do you still feel like Kansas is home? No, not at all, but he nodded along anyway. Yup. So there you go. Even though we all live in Austin and consider it home, we're still capable of returning to a different one. I'm sorry for asking this, Jason said. I don't mean it to sound harsh, but did the Woodlands feel less like home after your father died? Yes, Allison said instantly. It sure did, less so when my mother died. Once they were both gone, I didn't feel as anchored. You've been through that too, haven't you? Yeah, Jason said. I also know what it's like to be taken from my home and not be allowed to return. We would never do that to you, Ben said. Ever. You'll always be welcome here. Then why are you pushing me away? Ben's mouth moved, too shocked to speak, so he looked to Allison for guidance. Tell him how you feel, she suggested. I love you, Ben said to Jason. I know, Jason responded. I love you too, but I don't get... I'm trying to help you. We both are, Tim added. Allison held up her hand. Ben, what you said is good, but try telling him how this situation in particular makes you feel. Ben leaned back in his chair eyes unfocused as he seemed to search for the right words. It 
feels like I'm holding you back, he said. When you first came into our lives, the goal was to help you get back on your feet. Now you are, but you're scared to use them. Allison looked at him. Tim? I just want you to be happy. I am happy, Jason stressed. Tim shook his head. Not as much as you could be. When you're with William, it's like you're on drugs. Wait, are you on drugs? Jason laughed. I get why you guys worry, but I've got it figured out. I've thought about this. It's not like I made the decision while drunk and emotional one night. Then explain your reasoning to us so we can understand, Allison said. Jason nodded. William and I have been apart before, four years. He clenched his jaw and had to collect himself. Nothing changed between us. We still felt the same way, so we'll be fine. He could meet someone, Ben said. I never thought that anyone could get to me like Tim did, but then I met Jace. You know I love Tim with all of my heart, so imagine my surprise when it turned out I could love more than one person. I agree that William won't stop loving you, but what if he meets someone else he loves too? Someone who can be there physically and not just emotionally. Then... I'll wait, Jason said, looking to Tim. Like you did. Trust me, he said. That gets old. You think four years is bad? Try ten. And no matter how nice the new guy is, it's still absolute torture. Was it? Ben asked, looking concerned. Allison raised her hand. Let's stay focused. You love birds can rub beaks later. So it sounds to me, Jason, that you feel like William is a sure thing. Yeah, he won't stop loving me. Okay, are you implying that Ben and Tim will stop loving you? Jason looked to them both again, this time with a guilty expression. Yes. We will. Never, Ben began, but the almighty hand of Allison cut him off. Please explain to us why you think that Ben and Tim might stop loving you. Because that's what people do, Jason said. I know you don't want to believe it, Ben. We've talked about this, and maybe you're right, but that's romantic love. It's stronger. People always act like, Jason turned to Allison. Would you do anything for Davis? Would you die for him? Without a second thought, she replied. Why? Because I'm his mother. Jason nodded as if satisfied. And if someone was hurting him, if Brian started drinking again and started hitting Davis, that isn't fair, Ben protested. It's fine, Allison said. I think I see where you're going with this, Jason, but why don't you expound for us? Tell us about your experience. You all know the story, Jason said. I was taken away from my mom because her boyfriend was abusing me. But she didn't come save me. She didn't ditch him and get clean so she could have me back. And I know none of you believe this, but she was a good mother. She loved me at least up to a certain point. I don't know what happened after that. She gave birth to me, raised me with love, and still abandoned me. I wasn't the only one. I met tons of kids in foster care in the same situation, so I'm not going to screw this up. Jason's chin trembled. William will keep loving me, even if I can't be with him. And I know you're disappointed in me now, but I'll make it up to you, so... His voice cracked, and he started crying. Ben rose instantly and went to him, massaging Jason's shoulders and whispering comforting words. Then he looked to Allison for help. 
She nodded like everything was under control. Tim hoped she knew what she was doing because he was feeling down now too. He couldn't help wondering if Jason was right. His own parents weren't great. Tim hadn't realized how emotionally starved he was until he met Ben. He knew that Allison's father hadn't been a good parent either. He drank too much and was abusive. Ben's parents were amazing, but not all were. Jason wasn't being unreasonable. Some people loved conditionally and only if they got their own way. Bad things happen, Allison said. None of us can deny that. But we can't allow misfortune to stop us from living our lives. Cast your mind back a few years. Jason, you and Ben were eating breakfast when that little... When Ryan broke into the house with a gun. What happened was horrific. I wasn't even there, and I still didn't feel safe in my own home afterwards. The experience had to be even more traumatic for you all. Tell me, did you ever eat breakfast in that kitchen again? They nodded in unison. Why? Tim knew the answer, but the question wasn't directed at him. Instead, he waited for Jason to figure it out. At first, because... I wanted to protect you guys in case it happened again. Jason furrowed his brow. I might not be very tough, but I wouldn't let him shoot anyone. I'd do whatever it takes. You wanted to take care of your family, Allison said approvingly. Is there another reason you kept eating breakfast in that same kitchen? Jason nodded. I didn't want to upset Ben, so I put on a brave face. I knew if I acted like everything was normal, he wouldn't worry as much. Allison leaned back. To summarize, something bad happened, but you didn't let that stop you from doing what you needed to do. Did that get you shot? How many other Ryans have broken into the house since then? Four? Five? None, Jason said with a chuckle. I get what you're saying. Ben and Tim aren't the same as my mom. They might not do what she did, but isn't it smart to learn from bad things when they happen? Yes, it's okay to be cautious, as long as it doesn't make you paralyzed. I'm not, Jason said. I moved out on my own. He did really good, too, Tim said. We kept guilt-tripping him to stay, but it didn't work. Jason smiled. It nearly did. That's excellent, Allison said. So you're able to live away from Ben and Tim without feeling like it'll jeopardize your relationship with them. We're still in the same city, Jason said. The same state. There's a big difference between Texas and Oregon, Allison said amiably. That makes sense. Do you ever get so busy with work and friends that you don't see Ben and Tim as often as you'd like? Has, oh, I don't know. A week gone by that way? Jason nodded. Yeah, but we still text and stuff. And I know they're not far away. Good. Allison made a quick note. So, if you're comfortable spending a week apart, as you've already proven, maybe you would be willing to do so again? Jason shrugged. Sure. Allison's face remained neutral but Tim swore he could see a gleam of victory in her eyes. Right now, you're facing a lot of unknowns. Nobody could blame you for being apprehensive about visiting a new state. Why don't you take a week off and go up there? You'll get to see William and spend time with him. Even if you decide to stay in Austin permanently, at least you'll know what Astoria looks like. You won't have to imagine where he lives. You'll have seen it for yourself. Wouldn't that be comforting? Yeah, Jason admitted, seeming open to the idea. Excellent, Allison said. Now then, does anyone have a question they want to ask or something else they need to say? We'll take turns. Let's start with you again, Jason. The therapy session went on but Tim's focus kept returning to Jason. He had never realized how much they had in common, 
how they both came from broken homes, albeit in different ways. Going forth, no matter what Jason decided for himself, Tim was determined to be there for him, not only to love him in a way his own father never had, but to guide him toward the happiness Tim had found and that he knew Jason could discover too.